very fortunate this evening, the speaker we have. Uh, I'd like to invite first Dr. Modgill to come up and say a few words of welcome to you all. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, it's so good to see you all, many of your friends from the past and some current, and it's exciting. We have a contemporary history and old history in the room right now. We're proud of both. Um, let me <clears throat> first mention that uh, this is a series or a Lawrence Tech edition that has become popular and very prestigious. Every year we meet to honor one of us, uh, Harold Hotling, who was a teacher of professor of economics. I'm told he also taught business ethics, if I'm correct. And he had a lot of good friends. And actually, I live, uh, I have one of my best friends. I don't know if you, I haven't seen him yet. He was his neighbor, so he knew Hotling family. Uh, I think, Barbara, you know the Such Daves. Yeah. He's always here every year. I must be on the way or something. And he, I learned from him about your family and, and uh, Harold. And he was in awe of him. He thought a very great person, a great scholar, a good neighbor. On the campus, he was so admired and so well liked. And I think you will hear more about him. Obviously, this lecture is dedicated to his memory and his great work at Lawrence Tech, as we have many able professors. Each one of them could be recognized uh, when they move along, either in another profession or otherwise. So we're very proud of that. We have many important guests in the audience. Some are our colleagues from the past or current. It'll be, I'll be biting time if I introduce everyone, but there are some that, that are from other places, and at least a few know. We have with us Dr. Marburger, whose name is on the building in this hall in honor of his wife. Uh, Dr. Marburger, our fourth president. <laughs> Richard Marburg. And his son, Dennis. And Anne, our former registrar, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. And we have uh, Josip Torizian, principal of Manugian School, which is a great partner for us. We have partnership collaboration and some of our faculty here. Yes. Thank you. With us, two very important colleagues from my previous university, which I still hold title there as emeritus professor, that is Oakland University, the deans, dean and associate dean of Oakland University School of Education and Human Services are with us, right there. We have John Mar Margurum Lays at the dean, and Michael McDonald, associate dean. Thank you, and I'm sorry, yes, please go ahead. With us is also, of course, the person we are honoring his family. We, are with, we have with Barbara Hotelling, uh, Mrs. Hotelling, <laughs> and their son, George, who is here with us. Thank you. With that, uh, I take leave of you because you have much more better to listen to than this, but I'm delighted you're here, and we are honored with your presence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Modgill. Uh, to continue our tradition for the hoteling lecture, I'm going to ask my friend and colleague, Professor Corrine Stavish, to come up and say a few words of remembrance uh, of Harold. President Ronald Reagan said that if an economist had created Trivial Pursuit, it would have had 100 questions and 3,000 answers. He must have known Harold Hotelling because that is a fine description of Harold Hotelling whom we honor tonight. When he died, Dean Xiaoping Moore knew that the best way to honor him was to set up this lecture series. And she said how much he had contributed to the humanities department, to the College of Arts and Sciences, and to the university, and noted that the loss was great. Yes, his loss was great and broad and deep, she said. But so is his legacy. Harold Hotelling was a family man, a friend, and a philosopher. <laughs> 
As a family man, he, the love of his life, Barbara was here, and they co-authored articles, and he raved about everything that she did in the Lamaze and Duella movement, and he was the proud father of five children. But what warmed my heart the most and what I remember was when he brought his grandson, Dylan, to work as often as he could. He was also, even though family came first, he made Lawrence Tech his family, and we were his friends, his extended family, and he helped us. Joyce McKisson, our former administrative assistant in the humanities department, remembers when her husband Rick was out of work, Harold showed up before Thanksgiving with a turkey and a gift certificate for dinner. He also showed his friendship to a young colleague when Jim Lenz's um, second child was born and he had a one-year-old Harold did not wait but a few weeks before he showed up at the Lenz's doorstep and said to Jim and Sylvia, go out to dinner. I am babysitting. I am the father of five. I am highly qualified. <laughs> and Tracy Cash, our administrative assistant in the dean's office now, remembers that he would, in a very friendly way, tease her whenever she made the coffee for our college meetings because she always made decaf and Harold wanted the real thing, probably because he was the real thing. Not only was he a family man and a dear friend, but he was a philosopher. He was the one we all went to with complex questions and issues and could get 30 answers to one question. Professor Holly Helterhoff remembers being new to the faculty and dealing with a really tough issue and with great remorse went to Harold, but as friend and philosopher, he said to her, you did exactly what you needed to do. You identified the problem, went to the person who could solve it, and that was the best that you could do at that moment. And Holly still remembers that as good advice that guides her today. A couple of weeks ago, Dr. Scott Schneider and I were talking about some of the complex politics and economic issues that are in our country today. And Scott said to me, I, I want to go next door almost every day, because that's where his office was, next door to Harold, and ask him questions. And of course, he would have gotten at least 30 or 50 answers. Dr. Jason Barrett, our Humanities, Social Science, and Communication Department Chair, never fails to say what? At least a couple of times a week, quotes Harold, and as a philosopher, Harold would say, always certain, frequently wrong, Jim Rogers, former department chair of our department and former dean, remembers that he once asked Harold why it was, Jim said, that he felt this amazing affinity for his college football colors. There must be something about maize and blue, Jim Rogers said, that was just intrinsically and inherently better than any other college colors, say, for example, crimson and gray. And Harold quickly and wittily replied, maize and blue, that's because it was your Cub Scout uniform color. <laughs> Harold Hotelling was a family man, a friend, and a philosopher who was a scholar, teacher, and prominent economist. President Harry S. Truman once said that he wanted an economic advisor who was one-handed because all his economic advisors would begin by saying, on the one hand and on the other hand. If he had known Harold Hotelling, he would have known that Harold was multi-handed. Just last week, I had an exchange with Dean Bauer and I said, I miss Harold a lot.
And Dean Bauer responded, as do all who knew him. I wish all of you could have known the Herald Hoteling that we did, but I'm glad you're here to honor him. Thank you, Professor Stavish. Uh, so on to the, uh, the presentation for this evening. Our legacy or our uh, remembrance of Harold, we think, is best fulfilled by bringing in speakers that can inform our community about current events. And I think that's been the recurring theme of the speakers that we brought over the last nine years. And we certainly have a wonderful speaker to contribute, uh, continue that tradition tonight. Uh, Dr. Douglas Harris is professor of economics at Tulane University. And he is the Schleider Foundation Chair in Public Education. He is the founder both of the Education Research Alliance for New Orleans and also the National Center for Research on Education Access and Choice. He has scores of publication on education public policy. His book, Value Added Measures in Education, was nominated for the National Graumeyer Award. Guessing? And he's currently working on, I think what we're going to hear about tonight is his research for an upcoming book on education policy in New Orleans around the Katrina recovery. So please join me in welcoming back to Lawrence Tech, Dr. Douglas Harris. So I'm not young enough to just jump on the stage, so I had to go around. Uh, so I really appreciate being here, being back home. Uh, so home in a couple different ways. So one is because of Harold, uh, it's partly why I'm here. So I actually had a class with Harold uh, back 20 years ago, uh, and I still remember Harold. Uh, mostly I remember being a little nervous when I had to go in and see him uh, for, for this independent study we had. But the interesting thing is what I'm gonna talk about now is actually an offshoot of what Harold and I were talking about 20 years ago. Uh, so the, the charter schools and, and, and that I'm going to talk about are related to school finance reform, which was happening at the same time back in the early 90s in, in Michigan, it's, and this is all connected. So that's one reason I'm happy to be home. Another reason I'm especially happy to be here tonight is my family's here, um, and many of them in the audience. And my, my father, Stan, who many of you know, was a professor here at Tulane, at, Tulane, at Large Tech, excuse me, uh, until, until recently, and that was one of the reasons why I was taking uh, courses here, and my, my brothers also went here as, as students. So it's a family affair uh, with the Harris family and Lawrence Tech. So let me give you a little bit more background. Family members, they're actually going to come back up again in the presentation. They don't, they don't realize this yet. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of background. This map should look familiar to everybody. This is our, our metropolitan area uh, here in Detroit. I'm going to just zoom in a little bit more. You can see Royal Oak there is where, uh, where I grew up. Uh, you can see Southfield where we are right now. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more, and might, some might say I'm going to zoom in a little bit too far here. So this, this, is our, this is the family. One of these handsome gentlemen it was, is me when I was much younger. Uh, that is our house uh, where, where we grew up. And that is the, 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 the great green van that we piled into driving around right up. Now, this is not just a fun way to start, uh, but it's also relevant to, to where I'm going to go next. So let me zoom back out again. And now I'm going to change the map a little bit. This map is going to change colors, uh, but it's going to be the same map. So what is this, right? You, so you can tell it's the same area. You can still tell it's Detroit. You can tell that the outline in red there is Detroit. But what does this represent? So this is a map that was actually just produced recently by uh, another professor uh, at, at Harvard, uh, Raj Chetty, uh, as part of a project where they're mapping uh, opportunity in the country. And so what they did was they, they went and identified the people who had grown up in poverty, kids who had grown up in poverty, uh, in, all, in every zip code and in every neighborhood down to the census tract level in the whole country. You know, so this is going back many decades. And then track them forward to see how they were doing uh, when they were older. And so this map tells you the likelihood of somebody who's in poverty. So this is not a map of income, per se. This is a map of among people who grew up in poverty, what was the likelihood that they ended up coming out of poverty uh, in adulthood? Right? So red means almost nobody. Uh, and growing up poor uh, in the Detroit, in, in Detroit, uh, was able to, to get out of poverty, and the blue means a lot of people were able to get out of poverty. Right? So, so this this is to me a very powerful picture 
of, of what's, uh, what's happening. And this is partly, uh, partly the reason I'm bringing it up is that this is why I got interested in studying education because when I was growing up, I saw this, right? You, you can't live in the Detroit area and not see this. Uh, and so I used to spend a lot of time in Detroit. I used to go down and, and uh, intern at the Detroit City Council office and volunteer at churches and community groups down there. I took the bus down, I could see it every day. Uh, I didn't know this was true, but you could feel that this was true, that the opportunities that, that people must have had growing up uh, in Detroit were just not the same as the opportunities uh, that I had. Uh, so, let's, so let's try to back this out, and part of the, the purpose of, you know, we're going to get to schooling here in a second, but let's think about all the different reasons why this might be true. Why, why is it so hard if you're growing up in, in Detroit to get out of poverty? So one reason is family background, right? So in this particular graph we, or in figure, we controlled for that. We're only looking at families who are in poverty, uh, but, but that's gonna matter a lot. We know family background's the, the strongest determinant of uh, what happens. I was very fortunate growing up, uh, growing up in one of the blue areas in that map, right? We, 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 weren't, in, we weren't in poverty, but clearly we had more opportunity, uh, both because we had higher, higher income. You know, my dad had a PhD. I wouldn't probably have gotten a PhD if he hadn't had gotten a PhD. I wouldn't have been good in school if my mom hadn't read, read to me uh, when I was little. I had a great advantage, right? If, if life were a deck of cards, I was dealt the full house. Uh, and not everybody has that. Discrimination. So one of the differences between growing up in Detroit uh, and growing up in the suburbs is that disproportionately people growing up in Detroit who are in poverty are also black. Uh, and there's still discrimination in the world. So this is, this is, uh, this is a very real thing that has not gone away. Neighborhoods, your neighbors, your social networks, crime. I didn't have to worry about uh, walking out of the house and having anything happen to me. The biggest thing I had to worry about was trying to beat my brother in basketball. That was a luxury, right? That, that was my biggest worry in the world, was just trying to, to beat that, to beat my brother in basketball, that was a luxury, to, to have that be my biggest problem in life. Local labor markets. So there are just not a lot of jobs in Detroit, right? So if you grow up poor in Detroit and your family's in Detroit, you're not gonna have a lot of, a lot of opportunities uh, if, if you stay in that geographic area. There's just not a lot of jobs. Government services, social infrastructure, libraries, right? So my mom and I used to go to the library all the time and check out books. Uh, that was also uh, an advantage. All right, so that's the big picture. But here we're talking about schools, right? So I wanted to start off with this uh, because, uh, first of all, I think this drives my interest in this topic and I think should drive, uh, to drive the reason why we should be thinking about school reform. Um, but also want to frame this in terms of all the things that are, that are at issue here. So this is not just a school's problem. There are a lot of things going on that drive uh, the, the ability of everybody to have an opportunity. All right, so let's talk about schools. Let's drill down into that. We'll drill down into school reform. All right, so how do schools work? How do public schools work in particular generally? And this is true. Everything that's on this graph uh, in this table has been true for a century. The U.S. school system has not changed very much. Uh, since the, the late 1800s. So schools are governed by a locally elected school board. They're operated by public employees. Uh, they close when school districts have financial trouble. Teachers are paid based on experience and degrees. Teachers work with autonomy and job security. They have, usually have tenure and union contracts that, that also uh, protect uh, both their jobs and their working conditions. And students are assigned to schools based on where they live, okay? Now, an alternative way of running a school system, and this is one that is increasingly talked about, our Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, is, is an advocate of a more of a free market approach. So let's think about how that would uh, result in a different kind of school system. So in a, in a free market system, and, and I'm gonna say one here that would still be subsidized by the government, so the government would provide money in the form of vouchers uh, that students could take to any school that they choose, in theory. So in that case, the schools are governed by nobody. Right? It's just supply and demand. There's, no, there's nobody up uh, you know, in a government office or anywhere deciding which schools to open or anything like that. It's just supply and demand. The schools, de schools decide to open, schools decide to close, parents choose schools or not. They're operated by private organizations and employees. They close when market demand is too low, not when the district has financial trouble. Teachers are paid based on the decisions that their school leaders make. We'll put performance in quotes because anybody who's worked in any organization knows that nobody's really paid based on performance. Uh, teachers work as at-will at employees, meaning they can be fired for low performance. Uh, and students enroll in schools based on their own choices. So two very different models of thinking about 
uh, how we might run a school system. And these decisions are going, uh, are going to have consequences for sure. These are two very different, uh, very different approaches. And that's sort of the, the frame for thinking about uh, New Orleans and Detroit. So what's, what are the advantages of these different approaches? So with government, the, the strengths are stability and equal treatment. So, so governments are good for having rules and everybody's uh, uh, subject to the same rules. And a, and a public spirit to it. So if you've ever if you ever work with not all public employees, but most public employees think about what they're doing is trying to serve the public and serve the public good. In a free market, uh, very different set of advantages. Right there, the goals and the strengths are innovation and choice and options and variety, uh, and responding to individual needs. Right. So it's more of a focus on the individual as opposed to the the public at large. So two very different. So they're. They're different models in important ways, right? They have very different strengths. All right, so now let's get towards policy. Let's get, get a, a little away from theory and closer to reality here. So that same continuum, I had government on the one side and free market on the other, and you could think of there being something in between that I'm going to call managed competition, right? So you could have a hybrid model between those two. Uh, so on the left side, we've got the traditional public school system that I described. On the right side, we've got vouchers, and charter schools are in the middle at least in theory. So charter schools can mean a lot of different things. Uh, but again, we've got these, these two different policies, vouchers and charters, and they're expanding uh, very rapidly in ways that you might not realize. It's, it's, a, it's a somewhat subtle change. But we're now at the point where half of students in urban schools do not attend the school that they're assigned to anymore. So that's a huge change because uh, you know, a century ago, 90% of kids were attending the, the school that they were assigned to, and now it's, it's 50%. And that's 25% of, of students nationally who are not in that, that traditional public school that most of us are used to. So that's a big shift. So what does it mean? To, should we be worried about this? Should we think this is a good thing? Is this just a, a left-handed, right-handed problem, the way we were talking about earlier, how, how uh, uh, they're just going to have advantages and disadvantages, and that's the end of it. Uh, I think it's a little. I think there's more to it than that. So let's think about schooling as a market, and really let's just start off about what makes a good market in general. So forget about schooling for a second. Let's just think about how regular markets work. So what are the assumptions we need for a market to work well, to be efficient? So one is we need that the choices that individuals make don't affect affect other people. That that consumers have good information, that they have a lot of options, that there are no transaction costs, which means that when you go to the, you know, you go to the store to buy something, that it, you don't have to go through a lot of haggling. There's not a lot of, of red tape or anything to get in the way. You just go and you buy it. Uh, flexible demand, meaning you know, if, if a product is people don't want it anymore, then, then demand drops. Uh, flexible supply, meaning if, schools, if, uh, if firms want to open and want to expand their output, they can, they can do that. Uh, readily. And finally, the, the last assumption is probably the most important one is what's the goal, right? So the goal here, starting back at the top, is what does it make for a free market to be efficient? The presumption there is that the goal is that we want this, this thing to be efficient, and that's the only thing we care about. None of this works with schools. None of these assumptions hold, right? So let's, let's think about the reality here with schooling. So do the, do the choices, actually, let me take one step back for a second. Let me, let's go through this for one market. Uh, one regular market first before we get to doing it with schools. So let's think about buying a car. You want to buy a car, does your choice affect anybody else? Very little, right? So you go buy a car, you don't know who else bought the car, but about a car like yours, right? You, somebody else comes on the lot and buys the same car, you have no idea uh, that, that, that that even happened. So your choices generally don't affect uh, other people. Do you have good information? Yeah, you're buying a car, you have pretty good information. You go to con consumer's reports, you, you most people are looking for the same kinds of things, miles per gallon, price, uh, reliability, and so on. So you go to Consumers Reports or one of the rating systems, you get some pretty good information there. Many options to choose from, no question there. There are thousands of cars to choose from. No transaction costs. Yeah, you could, it might take you an hour to get in and out of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the place to get, get your car, but you can walk out of a car pretty quickly unless you customize. My dad always customizes everything. It takes him forever to buy a car. Uh, uh, flexible demand, so this is pretty obvious, so if, if somebody's not buying a car, if cars aren't going off the lot, then they're, gonna, they're not going to, uh, the demand, that means demand is, is dropping. People don't have to buy the cars. And supply is flexible. If nobody's buying, then the, the, the suppliers, automakers can make fewer cars. Uh, 
and efficiency is, is the goal. All right, so now let's talk about schools, because none of that works when we talk about schools. Uh, when you make a choice about a school, your choice does affect everybody else, right? Because one of the, the main driving forces of, of schooling is the other kids in the school, right? So most, most people, maybe even subconsciously, when they're choosing schools, and research bears this out, the number one thing they look at is the demographics of the students in the school. Not the, not the test scores, not the outcomes, uh, not the curriculum. They look at the characteristics of the students in the schools. They do that because they know that who their children uh, are in school with affects their students' outcomes, not just their academic outcomes, but their social life and, and whatnot. So that's very different from buying a car, for sure. Good information? Not really. I think uh, we often think we have good information about, uh, about schools, but we really don't. So think about what is, a, what is a good school, right? So a good school is one that helps your children learn. Well, how do you know how much they're, they're learning, especially when you get into to middle and high school? Everything's filtered through your kids. How many, how many of you have kids? How many of you think you got a really good idea how good the school is from your kids? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, a couple hands went up. Sometimes you can. Some, some kids uh, translate that well. Uh, but you know, if the goal is, of education is to get uh, children to succeed in adulthood, you have to wait kind of a long time to figure that out. And figuring out what the school contributed is even harder, in, in whether the teaching was really good teaching or not. It's, it's actually not that hard. You don't observe, the parents don't observe what's going on, except, again, through this sort of filtered way through their kids. So information's not very good, not as good as we think it is. Uh, many options to choose from. So schooling is different than really any other service uh, in that you have to get there every day. You have to get your kid to school every day, which means you can't go very far away from, from home uh, because geography limits that. And the schools have to be a certain size to operate. They have, they have their economies of scale and schooling, so there aren't going to be a lot of them, and, and you're going to have to go fairly close to home. So you don't have a huge number of options. Uh, you have transaction costs, so if you switch schools, as unfortunately we, we have done several times with our kids, it, it really upends social lives, not just their social lives, but our social lives, right? So we, we develop relationships with parents through the, their friends. Uh, so switch, every time we, we've gone through the switching of schools, it's been you know, kind of a, a huge adjustment. It's not just uh, filling out the paperwork, it's, it's just a whole social adjustment to, to switching schools. So people don't, very, people don't switch schools unless they really have to switch schools. Uh, flexible demand, no. By law, parents have to send their kids to school. Right? There, there's, there's fixed demand, it, it's not just inelastic, it's fixed. Uh, and fixed supply uh, as well to some degree because it's actually hard to, it's hard to get a school building, right? A building that makes any sense for a school. You can't just use any commercial strip uh, building for that. So there aren't gonna be a lot of options for school buildings either. And finally, what's the goal? Well, the goal isn't just efficiency, it's equity, right? So part of the purpose of schooling, maybe its fundamental purpose historically is we want everybody to have an opportunity which goes back to my, my earlier slides. I want everybody to have access to a quality education. That's a different goal, right? So it's not at all clear that, that markets are gonna be good at that. All right, so schooling's a very strange market. It's probably uh, the strangest market. If you look through, kind of down all, these, down all this list here, it's the only market I can think of that violates every one of these assumptions. So, so that means we can't just think about it. That gives us our first instinct that we can't just think that we're going to apply market principles here and expect a good result. So let's think about the implications of, of these assumptions not holding. So if we were going to put uh, a free market in place, a voucher program, we could expect that schools are going to select advantaged students. Why are they going to select advantaged students? Because of classmate effects, right? There's a huge advantage to being the school that has the most advantaged students. And we see this all the time in the research, too, in, in and voucher and, and choice studies. So the idea with school choice is we're supposed to be giving choices to, to families. To some degree, what's gonna be happening is we're giving more choices to schools, right? because schools, schools gonna really can't, public schools can't choose the, the children that they, they serve. But in a choice-based setting, they can. Uh, limited information, fixed demand, transaction costs, supply constraints all limit options and limit competition. So to the degree there's any competition going on here, it's going to be a very stunted form of competition. Uh, so that's, that's another outcome here. There's also going to be a hierarchy of schools. You know, because you've got some schools that are going to be selective, selecting advantaged students, those schools are not, only, they're not only going to have the most advantaged students, they're also going to get more additional resources. Uh, and that's going to reinforce uh, 
that, that hierarchy of schools, and it's not going to be equitable in that sense. Now, some of these things you could say are also true of school districts, right? So we don't have an equitable public school system either. School districts are not equitable uh, for a different set of reasons. Uh, but the argument here is that it, the free market system isn't going to probably solve these problems either. All right. So let's, now that's theory, right? We're getting a little, ab little abstract here. Let's, let's talk uh, some bread and butter. Let's talk about Detroit and New Orleans, two cities near, near and dear to my heart, one, one I'm living in now and one I, one I lived in and, and near bef before and for most of my life. Um, so these are interesting case studies, and it's not, it's not just interesting for me because I've lived in these places, but because Detroit and New Orleans are really at the center of the national school reform debate as two very different approaches to school reform. They've, gone, they've, they've both gone the direction of school reform, but they've gone about it in a very different way. Uh, and so in short, and I, and as I'm going to explain, Detroit is much closer to a free market approach, and New Orleans is much closer to that managed competition approach that I described earlier. All right, let's talk about Detroit first. So a few key things about Detroit. So charter school, uh, the law passed in 1993. Detroit was one of the first and most aggressive movers in the charter school area. About 50% market share charter schools, 50% uh, other public schools uh, in Detroit now. Uh, key features of this system. One is that there are more than a dozen authorizers. What's an authorizer? So with charter schools, uh, the government's giving money to the schools, and but somebody is overseeing the school, and that's the authorizer. Uh, what the authorizer actually does can vary a lot, but what, what's key about what's happening in Detroit is there are more than a dozen of them. There's not one authorizer. There are all sorts of different organizations that can decide to, to open up a, a charter school in Detroit. So that means it's a pretty uncoordinated system, uh, to say the least. Uh, and the, these authorizers are also located far away, generally. Most of the authorizers are universities that are spread out across the state, even though the schools are in Detroit. Uh, another key feature is that the authorizers are paid a percentage of the revenue that the schools bring in. Right? So the authorizer's incentive in that case is to not close schools, uh, because it's going to cut their own revenue if they do that. A uh, final key feature is that 80% of the charter schools in Michigan are, are for-profit, which is very unusual. So nationally, if you think about, if you hear about charter schools, very few of them are, are for-profit. Uh, but in Michigan, most of them are for-profit. All right, so implication here, as I said earlier, is that this is more, much more of a free market-driven system, right? There's not a lot of oversight uh, of the schools by the authorizers, partly because there are so many of them and they're far away, and they don't have a lot of incentives to be closing schools. Uh, and because of the, the profit motive. So it's a much more market-driven system. How, do, how do, is it working? Not very well. So, so this is the, you know, the other de kind of depressing picture here. So this is uh, a list of urban school districts that take uh, a standard assessment. So the, the test is the same test in every one of these cities. It's actually the same test that's taken across the country in a sample of, uh, of schools in every state. Uh, Detroit is at the bottom. It's, it's also at, it's at the bottom by a considerable amount, right? So, and these are not high-performing districts, right? It's we're far below Cleveland, right? The, uh, and Cleveland, Cleveland is not a high-performing district. Let me say more about these two dots on each one of these. So, one thing you should uh, probably are already starting to think is, well, Detroit has a very high rate of poverty, a lot of crime and, and disadvantage that may be driving the results down. That's true. And that's and the, the darker dot there to the left doesn't account for that. Right, so this one here does not account for that. The, the light blue one does account for that. Right, so even after we account for poverty, if we, if we look at now just the light blue dots as we go across Detroit, it's still way below. So it's not just the, the poverty rate that's, that's driving this. It seems like the system itself is, is just uh, not working, even though you know, these are pretty recent data. Remember, the charter school system started 25 years ago. So it's been a long time and had an opportunity to, to do its work. So what's, what's the problem? Why, why is Detroit not doing well uh, with this aggressive school reform movement? So one interesting observation is that the charter schools are actually a little bit better than the traditional public schools in terms of the, the achievement that they generate. Um, but, so, so remember, part of the mechanism here is it's supposed to create a system of schools and create competition that lifts all boats, right? That, that makes the whole system work better. That clearly hasn't happened, right? The, 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 system, when I, the numbers I showed you were both traditional public schools and charter schools combined. It was the whole city, right? So if, if that had lifted up uh, the whole system, then we would not see Detroit at the bottom. 
One possible reason for that is a combination of the very fast uh, uh, and, and substantial shift to charter schools. So the, the enrollments in Detroit public schools have de declined very quickly. And so you know, it's, it's very hard to cut your way to success, right? Even if, even if you have a great superintendent and you have the best of intentions and do things the right way, if all you're doing is cutting every year and the question is how slowly are you gonna cut, uh, it's gonna be hard to, to get out of that. So, but that's part of the system. That's part and parcel of what's going on. So if that's, if that's uh, how these market-based systems are gonna work, then that's a problem. There are also unintended consequences that are not that surprising when we think about how the market is so different uh, in schooling. So one is overcapacity. So something like 50% overcapacity in the system. So the schools are desperate to get uh, students in and they're desperate and do things in desperation that are clearly not appropriate. So there's one example that, that uh, has been reported uh, in the media where uh, schools were calling up families and saying, oh, sorry, your school closed this year, or is going to close, and, and you need to pick another school, and we want you to be our school. Well, the school wasn't closing. They were lying, right? They were just trying to get more, more students into their schools. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing you might, you know, you, you get crank call, we get these calls, these marketing calls uh, all the time that we know are, are not real, not real in, the, in the regular markets, but the stakes are a little lower most of the time in those cases. Here we're, we're talking about the lives of kids, and this is not something that, that we would that uh, we think is appropriate. But there's nobody overseeing this. There's nobody who has, uh, has the power to, to stop this. Uh, another way of looking at the evidence, I should say the evidence in Detroit is a lot less clear. So I'm gonna show you a lot of evidence in New Orleans. But I've been working in New Orleans for five years and have a whole team of researchers working on it, whereas in Detroit there, there isn't a similar enterprise. So I'm relying on a different kind of evidence here. Uh, in particular, I'm relying on pro-reform groups and what they say about Detroit. Because you would think if, if you know, this is a, re a reform uh, of the system, it's a charter-based reform. You would think that people who support charter-based school reforms would think this, if it was a good idea, that they would say good things about it, but they don't. Uh, so here's a, here are a few quotes. Uh, this is Scott Romney, the, that name will ring a bell, it's a relative of, of Mitt Romney, says the point was to raise all schools, uh, said Scott Romney, a lawyer and board member of New Detroit, instead we've had a total and complete collapse of education in the city. Uh, second quote, people, were, uh, here, people here had so much confidence in choice and choice alone to close the achievement gap, said Amber Ariano, the executive director of the Education Trust. Instead, we're replicating failure. Uh, final one, uh, Detroit parents uh, still have very few high quality options despite a number of different reform interventions. This is the Center for Reinventing Public Education. These are all pro-reform organizations saying it's not, not working either. All right, it's not working in Detroit. Let's, let's switch to New Orleans and let's see what a different approach might look like. All right, so after Katrina, uh, 2005, this, I was not there at the time. I, ca I came later, but uh, at, the, at that time, uh, the system in Detroit was, it was similar to New Orleans. They were badly failing school districts. So in New Orleans, uh, they were going through a new superintendent every 11 months. Uh, there was so much corruption in New Orleans that the FBI had its own field office in the New Orleans public schools. I'm not exaggerating. There were, there were so many cases that they were investigating and so many people who went to prison uh, for corruption that they had to have, have a field office there. Uh, something like 4,000 people were getting health benefits that were not eligible for health benefits. Uh, it, was, it was bad, and the, and the test scores were were bad. So New Orleans is the second lowest performing district in Louisiana, which is the second lowest performing state in the, in the country. So it was, it was really bad. Uh, so what happened? So, so they decided they weren't going to, after Katrina, they weren't going to let the system continue. Uh, the state took over essentially all the schools, turned the vast majority over to what's called the State Recovery School District, a single state agency, a single authorizer, that, that is key to the story here. The authorizer revenue was not based on school revenue, so the RSD, the amount of money they got had nothing to do with the number of schools that they had. Uh, within a decade, they had turned all those schools over to nonprofit charter operators, so they're all nonprofits, uh, and, and now it's a 98% charter market share in the city um, as of this year. So pretty soon it'll be 100%, all charter driven. Uh, another key difference is that this recovery school district, you know, again, single authorizer, so they could coordinate and they could, they could have oversight. You know, the, the office was in New Orleans, it's actually right next door to my, my office. Uh, 
Uh, they centralized the enrollment system so that it would be much harder for schools to, to game the system and, and try to trick parents into to getting kids into their schools. They centralized the discipline system because another thing that, that charter schools will do is to, to suspend the students into submission, basically, and just tell them that if you don't leave, we're just going to keep suspending you, and that's a way of forcing students out. So by centralizing the discipline system, they made it harder for school to do that. All right, different system, right? This is much more managed competition. You've got one, a different government agency, not the school district, uh, overseeing what's going on here. Uh, did it work? So uh, for the researchers, the next slide in the, is, is for the researchers in the room. I'm just going to say these words really quickly. If you're not a researcher, you can totally ignore this slide. So I'm going to use two quasi-experimental methods, um, and there is some intuition to this. We're going to look at New Orleans before and after, right? That's what you would... That would be an instinct for what we might try to do. And then we're going to look at a comparison group uh, before and after and look at the difference in those differences over time, Com controlling for all sorts of other stuff. Uh, and it's a matched comparison group. So we, we came up with a comparison group, group that looks just like New Orleans uh, in other districts uh, in New Orleans. And we did it all sorts of different ways, panel, pooled, standard errors for the district level, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So let me show you visually uh, what this is. So. And I'm going to show you a whole bunch of figures, and so this is just the sort of template for the figures. So we're going to have the, the student outcome on the, the vertical axis there. It's going to be test scores, high school graduation, college going, and so on. And then we have this kind of this period over here, which is before the reforms, right? So red is going to be when the reforms start and when Katrina hit. And what we want to, want to have happen is we want this to be a nice flat line, which is going to tell us that the comparison group in New Orleans were on a similar path before the reforms happened. That, gives, that tells us that the quasi-experiment is a good quasi-experiment because the comparison group was doing just what New Orleans was doing beforehand. And then, then we can look for effects, right? So either, if there's a positive effect, we would expect something like this or maybe something, you know, a jump up in a, a more horizontal line. If there's a negative effect, you know, we'd expect this. If there's no effect at all, it would just keep going along flat. Okay, so that's the way to read these figures. All right, so let's start off with science scores. That looks like a positive effect, right? So they're, they're tracking along together. The blue, these bigger blue uh, parts on either side of the, the confidence intervals, but you can mainly focus here on the black lines. Uh, so tracking along together, reforms hit, scores shoot up. And these are huge differences, right? So this is taking, this in this case, taking the uh, the average student in New Orleans, let's say if that was the 50th percentile, we're moving that student to like the 68th percentile, right? Which you might think is, well, that's 68th isn't that great, and that's true. Uh, but to move a student, to have a school reform, move the average student that far, I've never seen that before. I've studied a lot of school districts, and I've never seen an effect that big. All right, so that's science. Social studies, same. Math scores, pretty much the same, although there was a little bit of an upward trajectory. Uh, here at the beginning, reading scores, same. High school graduation, a little bit uh, more erratic, but still positive, right? So here, this is zero now, and it still jumps up, although it comes back down. It's still positive, um, so, so an increase in the graduation rate uh, in most years. College attendance, uh, 15 percentage point increase in college attendance. College graduation, right? So. I didn't honestly expect to see any effect on college graduation because it, this is looking at ninth graders to get to graduate is like eight years later and we've only had, we only have like 11 years of data, right? So for the reforms to have worked, to see an effect here, it had to have been a really immediate effect uh, on, on students. And yet we still see uh, positive effects there. So we don't have the, the nice black line here because we don't have enough years of data to actually uh, do it, but that's sort of the baseline and we still see it, the college graduation is jumping up. Uh, so this is pretty different from Detroit. Uh, so the uh, increase in achievement, so I said 50th percentile as an example. New Orleans is actually at the 22nd percentile as a district uh, nationally and raised the entire district up and in the, in the average student up to the 37th percentile. Again, 37th isn't great either, but you know, if, you, if you're ever going to get good, you have to, get, you have to see these kinds of improvements. Increased high school graduation by three to nine percentage points, college outcomes by three to 15 percentage points. It's really unusual to see all of these increase at the same time. So sometimes we get the test scores to go up by making it more rigorous, but making it more rigorous makes it harder and students tend to drop out more. All right, so to have both of them going up, so you're keeping the students in school more and you're raising the scores at the same time, that's hard to do. All right, uh, 
some other complications to this, right? Channeling my inner herald hoteling, right? There's a left hand and a right hand. Part of the right hand here is that funding also went up, although funding went up in part because of the reforms. It's kind of a complicated story. M you know, my general interpretation is it couldn't just be the funding, uh, but that that was part of what's going on here too. Resources matter, so I'm not, uh, don't, don't want to make anybody think that I don't believe that. All right, would this work in Detroit? So let's accept my premise perhaps for now that it worked in Detroit, it worked in New Orleans, it, it raised outcomes uh, more than I've seen uh, any reform in, increase outcomes in any district before. Uh, could it, would it work elsewhere, would it work in Detroit? Not sure about that actually, right? Sure. In what sense is it managed competition? In what sense is it managed competition? It's all centralized by one. Yeah, well, one and a half, we'll say. So there are still a handful of schools under the control of the district. Uh, the recovery school district, for most of that time period, had about 75% to 80% of the students in schools. But it, but it was only those two agencies that were involved. So the recovery school district was managing and when I say managing, they're not running them the way traditional public schools. They're all charter schools, but there's charter schools with oversight. But they're paying attention to their outcomes. They're closing low-performing schools. If they're not meeting their, their benchmarks, they, they shut down 36 schools out of 80 schools uh, because even after they had opened post-Katrina, if they weren't, they weren't making it, they shut them down. So there was really strong oversight uh, and strong accountability as well as uh, oversight over the rules that I mentioned on discipline and the enrollment system and so on. And where are they Say again? And where are they yes, yeah, and, and so the, the district controlled, controlled the buildings and, and could determine uh, which schools, which kinds of schools open and where they open. Yep. Sure. Yes. That was about 10%. Some of it came from uh, increases in local revenue, and so I, I hinted that some of it was actually driven by the reform. So part of what happened is that the local population is much more supportive of the schools now. And so the, the, there have been two bond issues, uh, or two millage elections since Katrina, and the percentage support was higher than they, they had been before. So there's much more support for uh, funding. So part of it was that. Part of it was from uh, philanthropists. Uh, part of it was from the federal government. So there are a few different uh, sources in there, but it was about 10% total increase in operating. Yep. Uh, so this you So charter schools do close, and I'm not saying they don't, especially nationally where there's, I think, more oversight. I think the authorizers are more involved. And charter schools have closed in Michigan too. But I think my, my sense is it's mainly not the authorizers doing it. It's the schools just fail uh, and, they, and, and end up. Uh, and so it's good, and, and it's good that they end up exiting the market if they're failing. What's that? Yes, but they might, they can, the schools themselves may fail without the authorizer intervening is what I'm saying, it's that it's more of a market force pushing them out. And this happens in New Orleans too, that sometimes they just don't get enough students and they can't function, they just say, we give up, uh, we, we, we're not gonna make it. So sometimes it's the authorizer stepping in and sometimes it's the market stepping in. Yeah. All right, so New Orleans is different on a few different dimensions here. And one reason why I'm not sure that this would work elsewhere. Uh, so one reason is the very low performance. Now Detroit and New Orleans had very low performance to start with. Um, and so in that sense, they have that in common. But New Orleans is different in two ways. One is that uh, after Katrina, there was a huge outpouring of support to the city. Uh, people wanted to come to the city to help rebuild. It was almost like the Peace Corps. Uh, you know, people coming down, they weren't worried about money. You know, they just wanted to help the city. You know, they, they were willing to work long hours in difficult conditions to, to try to help. Uh, second advantage was because it was the first city to go down this really intense school reform path uh, that it also had an advantage that people nationally who wanted to be involved in school reform wanted to come to New Orleans, right? It was like the Silicon Valley, and still is, like the Silicon Valley of school reform. If you want to, go, if you want to be in school reform, you come to New Orleans uh, at least for a few years you know, and learn how the system works. 
and, and go off to other places. So that was a pretty big advantage. And other cities are not going to have that advantage. Nobody else is going to have that advantage. Uh, so that's something uh, that I think you know, is contributing here that just doesn't generalize to other situations. Uh, all right, so I don't want to make sweeping generalizations about New Orleans, right? That's what I, that's what I study. Uh, but I do want to look at it now in terms of other evidence. And I'd say the, the general patterns that we see here uh, also fit other evidence. So let me talk about that for a second. Um, so you know, it, charter schools tend to work better than vouchers. So, so there's now you know, more evidence, uh, including some that we've released. If I, if I showed you those figures with the, you know, the, the straight lines either going up or down, we did a similar study for the voucher program that also operates uh, in Louisiana, and the effects are negative. Right? So it's not just that they're less positive, it's that they're actually negative, that students, when they switch to a private school through a voucher, do worse. Uh, in Louisiana. The same thing is true in Ohio. The same thing is true in Indiana. So the, the places where there have been statewide evaluations of, of vouchers show negative effects. Um, and so that's another evidence when we think about, think about uh, the free market versus managed competition. This is another piece of evidence on that. Uh, another piece is that uh, charters and vouchers seem to work better in urban areas. Uh, generally. So, so this is probably not something that we want it to do everywhere. So so private schools seem to work better in urban areas. You know, the evidence, uh, not, a, not a, as much evidence on that, but there's some evidence supporting that. So if that's the case, it suggests that this kind of approach isn't something that we should sort of overhaul the whole school system nationally. Uh, that it suggests it's more something that we see a low performing urban school system, maybe it will help turn it around. And much, much more of a, a, a narrowly tailored potential uh, intervention as opposed to a broad-based one where we want to upend a century of history with school districts. Some other uh, pieces of evidence here. So New Orleans also evolved over time. So there was a period of three or four years in the middle of the reforms back from about 2009 to 2012 that it was actually more like Detroit. Uh, that the, the recovery school district was just getting off the ground. They hadn't uh, turned all the schools into charter schools yet. Uh, they hadn't recentralized the enrollment system or the discipline system. Uh, and so during that period, we saw more problems, right? So we can even look within New Orleans to see some evidence uh, that uh, the free market system is, is going to be problematic. Uh, and so it was, it was the problems of pushing charter schools, pushing students out the door uh, and um, uh, and unfairly recruiting students and, and poaching students from other schools that led them to get involved to begin with and to, and to impose those rules. Um, we also saw evidence in New Orleans of uh, spend, increasing spending on administration and actually less on instruction. Uh, and this seems to be an economies of scale story that in, now you've got 40 different organizations running schools instead of one organization running schools, the school district and whatever inefficiencies you might think that the district has, having 40 organizions, even well-run organizations, they're gonna, you're going to have some loss of efficiency there, right? Because now you need 40 lawyers, 40 IT people, you know, 40 of everything uh, to make the school operate. So, so there's a, a significant increase in administrative spending. Um, uh, that, that may be a natural outgrowth of, of a market-based system. Uh, the teacher labor market. So the, the teachers in New Orleans are very young. Uh, often uncertified, certainly not very extensively trained, and have very high turnover rates. They don't stay very long. Uh, the turnover rate skyrocketed after the reforms went in. Uh, and I think there's pretty wide agreement, even in New Orleans, even among the people who support the reforms, that there's no way the system gets any better from here, and it may get worse unless they turn that around. You, there's no way you have a great school system with, uh, with a whole uh, workforce of inexperienced, uncertified teachers. Uh, and it, there's, there's no, I think, debating on that. Uh, we saw some increases in segregation, although the district was heavily segregated to begin with. I mentioned that schools were pushing out students. So even in the managed competition system, uh, there, there are some unintended consequences here. And I want, want to make sure and be upfront about that. All right, so what are the broader lessons here? I want to move towards the end here so we can have more back and forth. So I frame this as a conversation about markets versus governments. Uh, so what are the lessons here? So one is I think the, the evidence here suggests that school districts often are not so bad. Uh, in fact, if you, if you live uh, in, in the suburbs, most people are pretty happy in the suburbs with their schools, with their school districts. Nobody wants to shut down the school district and, and turn it over to, to private schools. I uh, don't, don't hear that very often. Uh, 
and you know, again, a lot of this goes back to a, to a very uh, has a very old lineage, and the system has worked uh, for the worked very well for for a long time, in most places. Um, you know, in those, in a district-based system is going to have several advantages. One is it's going to uh, help reinforce neighborhoods, right? So people like being able to walk to school. I got to walk to school. We uh, we, we all were assigned to a, to a school based on where we lived, and I knew the other kids walking to school, and that was that was a nice thing, and the, and the parents got to know each other better that way too. Um, District have more expertise, so there was a there was a drop in a, achievement just in the last couple of years in New Orleans, and so they were interviewing CMO leaders, and the CMO leader said, "Well, you know, I just can't afford to have a curriculum specialist." Hmm, well, that's a problem. All right, so they don't they don't have the the capacity to to build up that expertise. Again, this economies of scale problem is is real. So any just about any school district is going to have a curriculum specialist, but the schools here couldn't. Um, uh, teachers will be more experienced. You know, we, as much as you know, we, we might not like you know, having so much job security and having tenure and making it hard to dismiss low-performing teachers and so on, that's a job benefit, right? And teachers aren't paid very much, and so you know, making it more attractive to them by giving them job security and giving them autonomy over their work. So if you give them job security, it means they're also going to have more autonomy uh, to to uh, to try new things, not to be driven by by tests uh, and so on. So there are, there are advantages to that. Uh, as well, so uh, so part of the message here, even though the, even though New Orleans worked, right? So I think people probably halfway through you were thinking I was going to be New Orleans cheerleader and I was going to get up my pom poms and start cheering for it. But uh, I'm not sure that that's going to work in other places. I think school districts still have a, still have a lot of advantages, and and in most places are probably still the way to go. The question is, what do we do when they fail? Right. What do we do in the Detroit and New Orleans cases where you know, the, the FBI has a field office uh, in, their, in the district and the, they're s sending out checks to thousands of people who don't even work for the district? You know, that can't be allowed to continue, so we may need a backup plan, and I, th and I think uh, this, this may offer one. But we have to think about, in that case, what's the role of government? Right? So if we're not going to have school districts, if we are going to reform the system, what's a, what does this tell us about what the government ought to do? And it doesn't have to do it through school districts. It doesn't have to do it through the recovery school district uh, the way it was in New Orleans. But I think there are, it, does, it does point to, the whole analysis points to six roles for government. One is holding schools accountable. The market's not going to function very well. It's not going to create a lot of competition for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. That the government's going to have to step in and have accountability and to shut down low-performing schools, even if they're making enrollments, uh, even if they have enough students to continue operating. Uh, transparency, making sure that there's good information out there, uh, making sure that the money is being spent uh, in, in legal uh, ways and, and, and reasonable ways. Uh, engagement, trying to figure out what schools does the community want, right? So in a, in a school district-based system, if you wanted to answer that question, you would go to a school board meeting, right? And you could say, you know, these are the kind, these, this is what I would like to see. I would like to see this program or that program. There's nowhere to go in Detroit if you want to say, I want this kind of school. There's nowhere to, to register that because nobody's in charge of it. It, it doesn't have... It doesn't have a leader. Uh, accessibility, making sure that disadvantaged students have an opportunity given the incentive that schools have to select advantaged students. Uh, coordination, um, you know, one, one element of coordination I haven't, uh, haven't gotten to is, is the teacher labor market. Right? So the other thing that's happening in New Orleans is that the, the local universities, uh, which had been producing large numbers of, of teacher education graduates, don't really graduate any anymore uh, because the charter schools weren't hiring them there was nowhere for them to go, and so the programs basically just shut down. So now there's no supply of teachers, because, partly because of this lack of coordination. The, the charter schools say they want those programs to open up, but no one program has any power to say, okay, we'll, we'll take a certain number of graduates, or we'll take a certain number. There's no, they're so discoordinated, they can't do that. They don't have anybody to, to uh, coordinate that the way a, su a school superintendent would. Uh, and finally, enforcement, like have rules, enforce the rules. Uh, it, it's one thing to have them, but if you're not actually going to follow the rules, then it doesn't do you any good. So I think New Orleans got this right. So if we think about these six roles, the recovery school district did almost all of these things uh, well. Accountability uh, was you know, at least intense accountability. Uh, uh, transparency was not great. I would say that was transparency and engagement were probably the two where they were, uh, they were weaker in New Orleans, and I think they recognize it and are, are trying to, to work on that. Sure. 
So my, the intent is that it applies to everything, right? That these are basically minimum roles that any government should play. So even if we're going to go to a more decentralized, more market-driven system, that we still need the government to do things, right? And so these are the things that I think under any scenario, the government's going to need to do these things. It doesn't have to be the way a school district does it or as, a, or as intensively. So districts have much more... Uh, much stronger roles than these roles, right? School districts set the budgets and they set the curriculum and they hire teachers and you know, they're, much, they're much more into the operational side of this. These are actually a much more limited set of roles relative to what a traditional school district would do. So what I'm saying is even if you're gonna go away from the district model, the government still needs to do things. And, and so the idea here is let's think about what the government really has to do and what you might have other organizations do or let the schools themselves handle. Which, which actually is a nice segue to the, to the next point, which is one thing we haven't talked about here much is other organizations, right? We've talked about markets versus government, uh, but the nonprofits are actually really important uh, in New Orleans. So charter schools have charter boards. I know we have a charter board member here because we were talking at the, uh, uh, at, at, uh, beforehand at the reception about that. So charter boards, like all nonprofit boards, hold those organizations accountable. So if they're doing things like recruiting students or pushing students out, uh, recruiting students inappropriately and pushing students out, the board can step in and say, you know, we heard about this, you can't do this, right? So the boards have an important role to play. Journalists and community activists. So the, the, there was a huge spike in discipline incidents during that free market phase in New Orleans. And one of, the, one of the reasons that it came back down again was that there was a lawsuit filed uh, against the district. The Southern Poverty Law Center filed a, filed a lawsuit, and that, and that put enough pressure and there was enough public attention to it that that brought uh, those numbers back down again. So that was important. Having researchers uh, to study it, right? So we've got a whole team of people, a great, a great team working actively with the school district, working with the recovery school district, working with uh, community activists, trying to, to answer their questions. That we don't have a position on it. It, people will say, oh, you know, I really wonder about this. I say, okay, well, let's see if we can answer that question for you. Um, yeah, that's part of transparency. Foundation leaders are really important too. too. They, they're going to they're have funding to, to bring to bear, and they can use resources for all of the above, right, to fund the journalism, to make sure that you get some really in-depth stories about what's happening in the schools, to fund community organizations, to, to register parent uh, concerns uh, and interests, to fund research uh, and evaluation. So... It's not just a government versus markets. It's more of a civil society way of thinking about uh, how we can run schools. All right, so just a few concluding thoughts, things I want to leave you with. One is that schools matter, which should be pretty obvious. Uh, we should not accept persistent failure of, of schools. Uh, schools are only one part of the poverty problem, and so when we go back to that, that earlier figure, it's, that's not all driven by the schools by any means, uh, but it's one part of the story. Governments matter, right? So even we tend to think of, you know, we tend to be either I like governments, I like you know I like markets, and, and tend to have that sort of polarized conversation. The reality is we need both, and we and we we need different uh, different uh, groups to be doing different things. So markets are not inherently better; they're better at the things that we that they do, right? And and they're they're good at making cars and selling cars. Uh, they're probably not going to be very good with schools. But that's okay. I don't want the government to make cars, but these are different activities, and we have to think about structurally how, how the, the basic features of the market, setting aside any policy decisions, are inherently different. And finally, that, that the people matter. That I hope you know, one thing to take away here is that this is something we should care about, uh, and I want to leave you with just uh, this final thought that we shouldn't forget this map, right, because this is really sad. So, thank you. Do we have any? Do we have any questions? Thank you, for, P Professor Harris. It was a very interesting discussion that you shared with us. I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts on the role of the homeschooling movement and what impact that's having on, on all of this. I think I bring this up because I, I hear and see a lot about this, and I think there are some parents who feel that transparency, accountability, effectiveness, and objectivity in education is lacking when it's done governmentally, so they're trying to bring it literally in-house, and, and what sort of impact does that have on this other picture and the structural things and that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a tough one because uh, with homeschooling has now become intertwined with virtual schooling, right? So, so now most, most homeschooling, uh, the, the families are using virtual schooling options to, to provide the, the, some of the instruction, but especially the curriculum and the, and the tools to, to make that possible, because most parents aren't going to be able to create that from scratch. 
uh, I certainly wouldn't suggest that we should have uh, you know, the same kind of accountability that we're going to shut, going to have government you know, officials go into the houses and shut down there and say, you may not educate your, your child. Um, so I think a lot of it is more about transparency of those systems, of so making sure that uh, we're testing the students, you know, looking at how they're doing overall, if they're not doing well, intervening at least in the virtual schooling model and then the resources that those parents uh, are getting to make sure that uh, one way or another, if, if they're going to make that choice and they have the right to make that choice to homeschool, that, uh, that, that there's, there's a good outcome for everybody uh, in that. I had a, a, a quick question regarding the, um, when you were showing the data regarding the improvements in the test scores. Specifically, um, what role did, uh, I wonder if you could talk about professional development of the K-12 teachers, what role that actually played? Because you and I had a conversation earlier about yeah. how uh, content is, is being taught in schools. And I'm a graduate of DPS mm -hmm. uh, schools. Uh, the example that I had used was years ago when you were learning mathematics, it was a certain way that you were told that you had to solve a problem, even if you had the answer correct. And it turned off a lot of kids, including myself, to math. You know, there are different ways to learn. So I wonder if you could just comment on the professional development piece to improve those test scores and the classroom experience. No, that's a great question. In, in charter school-based systems, professional development's not usually, it's, it's on the one hand not very good because it's hard to do, right, again, to have the expertise to be able to do good professional development. On the other hand, it tends to be more targeted to what that school wants, right, so the charter schools have a particular theme or they have a, a specific need, they'll tend to, to be much more targeted about it, whereas in traditional public schools, professional development tends to be really generic and detached from uh, what's going on. Uh, in the classroom. So certainly professional development is important. I mean, the main way in which teachers <clears throat> improve, you know, what the research suggests is, is experience, right? So just having more years of experience. And so one of the concerns then in, a, in a, the charter-based systems is if you're always going to have this sort of churn of inexperienced teachers, they're never going to be very good. And you're going to be leaning very heavily on a scripted curriculum yeah, and on, you know, basically making it, uh, well, I don't want to use the term idiot proof, but basically that's kind of how they're setting it up. They're, they're, they're giving, they're, they're sort of forcing teachers to, to teach in a particular way, uh, in a very scripted way, which is not very engaging and also not very interesting for, it's not very interesting for anybody, for the teachers or for the students uh, to, to teach that way. And so there are sort of these two, those are ex kind of two different extremes of how to handle this, but I think to get great schools, you have to have teachers who are experienced and who have good professional development. And it doesn't have to be formal either. I think a lot of it is just having your principal come in and observe you in class and give you feedback, having a, having a collaborator come in and observe you and, and, and give feedback. Like that's, I think that's the, the most important professional development. But you have to have come in with some training for, the, for even that to be effective. This is a similar question uh, pertaining to the results that you showed about New Orleans and their performance. Mm -hmm. um, is it correct then to assume that only test scores were used to determine the student's performance or were there other indicators of student improvement? Well, graduation and college entry. To me, those, the college entry and high school graduation are the most important outcomes because those are the strongest predictors of life success are, are those two measures. So when I first saw the test score results, I thought, Okay, so maybe this is just teaching to the test, maybe it's cheating and so on, that there have been cheating scandals in other places. So, so I, at first I was, okay, well, this is good. Well, let's, let's see what happens when we look at the longer term outcomes. But the longer term outcomes look good too. So uh, yeah, if we were just looking at test scores, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as, as confident as I am that things really got better. Well, two things happened. One was because they shifted to charter schools that are private organizations, for those teachers, the union contract was irrelevant uh, because they had moved to a different organization. Now, they could reunionize at the charter schools, but only, I think, three charter schools have reunionized out of you know, 85 or so now. Um, but the district, which didn't have to get rid of its union contract, did. So even the district schools are also working uh, without a union contract now. Uh, so. You know, some people like to want to make the comparison between the recovery school district schools and the, and the district schools, but you really can't because the, the district schools were heavily influenced too. If, if the, 
the recovery school district side of the reforms was the most intense school reform the country had ever seen. What happened to the school district was probably the second most intense school reform that ever happened uh, because of uh, the, the end of attendance zones. There are no attendance zones in New Orleans. There are no union contracts. There's no tenure in any of the schools. What else? What do we got? Um, since we're having such a hard time with um, reforming our public school system, why don't we mirror what uh, other school systems like in Scandinavia and Germany and what they're doing and the success that they're having? Yeah, so it's kind of an interesting debate because it, there are a lot of things that we know work in a sense, especially with regard to, to test scores, but it's hard to scale them up for some reason. Part of it's because we can't all agree on what the goal is. Uh, part of it is the, the whole model is different. So in Scandinavia, teachers uh, have a ton of preparation. They're paid very well. They're well respected in ways that just aren't true in the US anymore. So it'd be very hard. There's a, there's a big distance to get from here to there uh, uh, in, in making a system look like that. You have to have teachers who are extremely well prepared uh, to make that happen. And we've never been in that situation really in, in the US. And without that, then the whole model breaks down because then you're completely dependent on the expertise of the teachers. And if that's not there, uh, at least not to that degree, then it just doesn't, it doesn't work the same way. So you, you say, what do we do when districts fail is the, uh, is the question. What do they do in New Orleans when individual charter schools fail? Have they closed any and under what circumstances? Yeah, no, they've, they've closed, I think, about 40 schools. Uh, and, and that's a, a large percentage. So New Orleans is actually s smaller than Detroit. Uh, we, we have about 85 schools at any given time, and they've closed over 10 years, they've closed about 40, which is a big number, just for, based on performance. And then they give it to somebody else to run. They say, all right, we're not, they're not actually closing it, they're just taking it over and giving it to somebody else to run. Uh, and it's, mo it's based on these outcomes, based on test scores and graduation rates. And it's, and it's very, very formulaic in a sense, maybe even uh, too much so, but, but that means that if you're an F school and you don't turn it around in a few years, you're done. Uh, in, in ways that I've never seen anywhere else before. And the students actually do better, so we actually have a study of this, so you might worry that if a, student's, if a school's closed and the student's in the school at the time may be worse off because then they have the disruption, they have to go to another school and so on, but our research suggested that, that even those students do better uh, with the closure uh, because they end up in higher performing schools. So if you actually close schools based on performance, whatever definition of performance you wanna use, students are gonna end up in higher performing schools, almost by definition and that will raise their outcomes over time. And that's the main driving force in New Orleans. If we, could, if we wanted to attribute it to one thing, you know, we've got choice, we've got uh, the changes in the teacher labor force and so on. The one thing that's very clear is that the, the closure takeover process based on performance is the number one thing. Do you, know, do you know what is the reason why the teachers have such high turnover and uh, why they are not retained? There is a it was investigated yeah. or researched? Yeah, there are a few uh, pretty obvious reasons. One is that the, they're not coming in intending to stay. So a lot of them are Teach for America teachers who are only intending to come in for two years. So they're, they're sort of designed to leave. Um, some of them might have uh, intentions of staying longer, but they didn't come in certified. They didn't come in with a lot of preparation. So they hadn't made a really strong commitment to the profession. Uh, to get into the classroom and so you know, one of the reasons having a lot of preparation on the front end can be helpful is that it, it sort of weeds out people who aren't serious about it and so in New Orleans they don't they don't weed people out uh, they just you know get them in the classroom and see how they do and if it doesn't work then they, they, they'll fire them or the or they'll leave but it creates a lot of turnover uh, in the process I have a question sure hi I'm Tammy I'm a state board of ed candidate and I'm very very glad to hear what you have to say today the question on um, the Scandinavia question, uh, I've been talking about accountability and transparency all over the state, and mm -hmm. what I have to say about that is I think the, the part of the problem is we have a lot of different people involved in education policy making in our state. The State Board of Education has been stripped of some of its power, the legislators jumping in, the governor's jumping in, different people are jumping in, and there's no accountability. And um, just generally speaking, I don't hear a lot of people talking about putting the children first in their education. Um, even you said the goal of education is equity instead of education. So um, I have two questions for you. You said vouchers had a negative effect in New Orleans, and I wondered why that was. And then um, you said we need funding equity. 
I wondered um, if you could add more uh, and what, what you mean regarding that, and if you're familiar with Michigan's funding. So on, on why the vouchers produce negative effects in New Orleans, it, that's hard to say. The why question is always the hardest question. Uh, even, even getting to the point of saying the what, what happened in New Orleans and being convinced of the student outcomes is, is hard. Why it happened is harder. Um, so I mean, I think part of it, it this, this, the, the simplest answer is that the schools that they're going to, the private schools, just aren't as good as we thought they were, right? So they, there's a sort of general assumption that private schools are better than public schools. That's probably not right. Uh, it's, it's certainly, at the very least, it's the case that there are a lot of private schools that are not very good. It could be that the average private school is a little bit better than the average public school, but not, it's just not what we perceive. It goes back to the information problem, which is very difficult to know how much learning schools are generating. Right? It's, hard, it's hard to measure that, and we don't measure that, and we tend to judge based on characteristics of the students, uh, the fact that it costs a lot of money to go to those schools and so on, that we use that as sort of a signal for what we think is a good school, even though if we think about a good school being one that generates learning, then it, it actually changes the whole calculus. Uh, your second question was about, what did I miss? Equity, funding equity. Yeah, I mean, there's still, most, uh, most of the North and Midwest especially, and, uh, has a lot of funding inequity. So part of it is just driven by the sort of the mechanics of local school districts. Uh, that if, if you let people sort into neighborhoods based on income, which mostly, is mostly what happens, then you're gonna have a lot of very high spending districts to the degree that it's determined by property taxes. So this is where, actually, this is what I worked on with Harold. So pr Proposal A back in 1993 was intending to break that link to some degree and shift some of the, the funding uh, to the state. And, and to raise up the bottom districts and to keep the, the, high, the high spending districts from spending so much uh, and getting too far away. So that helps some, but there's still pretty big differences in spending uh, across districts. So it's mostly a political will question. Like, are we willing to uh, spend more money in schools that don't have a lot of resources? Uh, so I think that's, and it's, if you're gonna rely on the property tax, it will almost certainly never happen. It has to be the state stepping in I'm not saying we should do it necessarily because that will create a different set of problems, but that's what you'd have to do if you wanted to make it more equitable. Hi, I guess. Um, my question is about the uh, recovery school district. Mm -hmm. um, who are the individuals who serve on that or in that district? Um, is, so, it, is it like a school board in the sense that the members are publicly elected? Because yeah. they seem to have a lot of power. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the recovery school district is actually not like a district in, in any of the usual senses. So there's a state board of education uh, in Louisiana. The state board oversees the, the Louisiana Department of Education. The superintendent for the state selects the superintendent. So there are a few layers in between the state board authority and the selection of the, the recovery school district superintendent. So, that, so it's not a... It doesn't, the district doesn't have its own board. The, the closest equivalent is the State Board of Education that, that chooses the state superintendent, that chooses the recovery school district superintendent. Um, 25 years ago, when we moved to Michigan from Canada, DPS had a population of 214,000 students. That number today is around 40,000. In your study, when you compared the students of New Orleans, did you compare them with the charter schools in DPS or DPS in general? I didn't, I didn't compare, and nobody has unfortunately <laughs> compared, well, I should say nobody. Uh, the analysis that I showed was combining the charter schools with the traditional public schools. Uh, and, one, and one of the reasons for doing that is that I don't have the data to do anything more. A second reason is just that we want to know how the system as a whole is doing and since the charter schools and traditional public schools are competing with each other, then looking at the, the city outcomes as a whole is the right way to look at it. In New Orleans, it was a different story. I was comparing New Orleans to, to comparison districts uh, in traditional public schools and other uh, surrounding parishes. And how many students in New Orleans are in charter schools today? About 98%. That's how many students? Oh, how many students? 46,000. 46,000. Yeah. There are 150,000 charter uh, students in Michigan today, just yeah. for your information. Yeah, yeah. it's de and definitely growing. still growing, yeah. Thank you. Maybe yeah. I uh, can ask those of you who have questions to hold on to them. We're gonna have a reception right after the event and that'll give you a chance to prompt some conversation with Professor Harris. If you'll join me in thanking him for coming this evening.
And we just have a small token of our appreciation. A little Thank Lawrence you. Right, thanks, Thank Jason. you so much. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. And please join us in the reception. Professor Harris will be out to chat with us.